Hello, it's a pleasure to be back in Georgetown because I'm actually this semester away, so it's a great opportunity to come back. And thank you, Tom, for the invitation and for the opportunity to be here. Um, you heard before that we were going to fight it out, that we are going to be entertaining. I'm afraid we are going to be very earnest, very serious. Um, I do not see my uh, task as winning points in a debate. I concede defeat to Jerry from the very beginning. You can never really win against a professor of law <laughs> in arguments. And I can never win with his humor. I mean, you know, basically, he's much more humorous than I am. So I'm not going to try to uh, uh, basically win points. But not only that. I see my task and obligation, and I'm saying the obligation, to complicate uh, our frameworks and to bring uh, contextual problems into our discussions. Indeed, I'm going to argue both for and against proselytism. Not because I want to have it both ways, have the cake and eat it too, but because I'm torn. I'm torn, I'm truly torn. And I see the arguments for and against, and I want to divide these arguments into theological rationals, for and against proselytism, legal rationals, for and against proselytism, and sociocultural rationals, for and against proselytism. So let me begin, begin with the theological rationals. I fully acknowledge the religious duty to preach the good news, to proclaim the gospel. For some religious, at least, certainly for Christianity, this is a duty, an obligation, which might, must be taken very seriously as central to their religion. And we heard a very eloquent presentation this morning from a Baptist point of view. But against this religious duty, there is a moral obligation, which I must take equally seriously, to respect other good news and other gospels, which other religious persons, which other humans take equally seriously. In the case of the Christian gospel, the mystery of salvation is complicated by the historicity of revelation and of God's economy of salvation. Just think of the genealogy of Jesus, as it appears in the gospels, as being linked directly to Abraham. But this reveals it precisely as a particular genealogy of the children of Abraham that has nothing to do with other unrelated ancestries. Now here we are confronting the fundamental theological philosophical paradox, which becomes evident with the multiple competing universalisms which emerge with the axial age, Jewish, Greek, Confucian, Buddhist, etc. Axial age was a term invented by the German philosopher Karl Jaspers to characterize this period of time, roughly between the 6th and the 4th century before Christ, in which all our universalistic, philosophical, moral, and religious conceptions emerge. And basically, all the others we have are derivation from this. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, Zoroaster, Socrates Plato, Confucius, Buddha, all of them are contemporaries. All of them are universalist prophets teaching a particular universalism. And the lesson which I, as a student of history, take is that every universalism is particularistic and irremediably so. The mystery of salvation for a Catholic, at least, which I am, consists in the fact that the proposition extra ecclesia nulla salus, there is no salvation outside of the church, or there is salvation only through Jesus Christ, would exclude perhaps as much as 90% of humanity from God's plans of salvation, if we take it literally. Obviously, uh, it's very hard to accept such a notion, and therefore we need other theological rationals to understand how uh, the different religions may be parts, all of them, of God's plans of salvation. Certainly, we should be with a lot of humility. We should not try to arrogate ourselves uh, uh, that we are the ones that know God's ways 
and that uh, 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 we know God's plans for humanity and for creation. So this is uh, uh, the first pro and con uh, uh, theological rationale. The second, legal juridical rationales for and against. I accept and defend the right to freedom of conscience and freedom of religion as an inalienable individual right. I'm willing to concede gladly that this is the first basic mother individual right and the foundation of every other right. Paradoxically, it emerged precisely out of the wars of religion in early modern Europe against the very Westphalian principle, cuius regio, regio eius religio, that the subjects should have the religion of their sovereigns. And here again, the good lesson, it was the Baptists who became ones against this very principle. And it came out, the freedom, it was not the freedom of religion that came out of the wars. What came out of the wars was the freedom to emigrate which was a recognition that indeed the sectarians have no right to stay in somebody's territory, but have the right to take their religion with them, and nobody has the right to coerce them to accept other religion. And of course, then it was those sectarians that brought this principle to the American colonies. Not all of them, as we know, many of them had also established uh, churches. So this is the fundamental inalienable right of every individual the right to exit, the right to conversion, the right to be born again, which the religious sects brought to the American colonies. But this individual right, I would argue legally, cannot be translated into an equally inalienable right, namely that it is my right to proselytize and to convert others. It may be a religious duty, but to proselytize is not a right. It's not a legal right in the same sense. Uh, I have a right to the free exercise of my religion, but this right will inevitably class with the right of others to the free exercise of their religion. And here is where we are entering into rights. We are entering into legal context. And legal context means legal national context. Now, within a legal national context, I'm willing to accept the principle there is practically no limitations to the right to proselytize. When it comes to international context, it becomes much more problematic.